Town Board that um, knows both the uh, benefits of transit but also the challenges of when there is a subway, for example, that many of you, and I'm sure all of you who uses the young subway in the morning, knows that it is incredibly difficult to get on, whether it be the first attempt, sometimes the second attempt, maybe the third attempt. And once you get on in the subway, on the subway during rush hour, you're in there like a sardine. And while we debate at Toronto City Hall about the import and how to expand transit, we also need to make sure that we have a serious conversation and take real action on how to improve the overcrowding that we have in the current system. We also need to have a conversation, I would submit, about when we have more intensification in areas like this in Midtown Toronto. What kind of infrastructure do we need to support the people who are moving in to our neighborhoods? In other words, if you're going to be promoting intensification, we need to have public space. We need to have good transit. We need to make sure that hospitals have space. We need to make sure that the infrastructure can can support the new, uh, the, the new capacity demands. <clears throat> There's also been a debate at City Hall between various types of transit, whether you be a subway fan or an LRT fan, whether you uh, are on the so-called left or right, there are debates like that. But I believe that we are arriving at long last at a critical but far more intelligent moment which is rather than just debate what technology, or rather debate where transit will go, I think we need to have a conversation about no matter what transit we want, how do we pay for it? I think all of us learned in financial literacy classes when we were younger that if you want something, you need to have a realistic way to fund it. One of the priorities that you're going to hear about tonight is that we'll be going to the Toronto Transit Commission meeting this Wednesday, but has been discussed very publicly, and it's something that I've been advocating for for a long time, which is a downtown relief subway line. Now, have all of you heard about this in the news recently? Yes. So the benefit of a downtown relief subway line, as you'll hear, is that while we have overcrowding on the current Young University Spadina line, this will not only increase capacity, but will also extend transit to other parts of the city. This also, I believe, gets away from the divisive debate and really gets focused on something that we can all agree on, which is subways. I don't think anyone disagrees with that. The debate before was, where should they go? And I suggest that it should always go where there are reasonable projections of density and where ridership is planned on growth. Now, you're going to hear tonight about funding tools as well. Now, when we discuss funding tools, there's another component of this. Should the city of Toronto go it alone and charge a new tax or fee or toll or what have you to fund transit? Or should it be a more regional approach where we engage the greater Toronto Hamilton area? Now we all know that there are almost as many people commuting from the city to go to work as there are coming into the city these days. So we need to decide what kind of system do we want to create? And if we're all in the region going to benefit from a better transit system, should we all share the burden in funding it? That sounded good. <laughs> <laughs> now, you'll hear in more detail from our panelists who I'm going to introduce in a moment about the kind of funding tools that we should consider. But I'll tell you the ones that Toronto City Council has agreed to consult with the public on. And I tell you this now because when we get into the Q&A period of this, this evening, I'm curious to hear from you if, if any of these are the kind of revenue tools that you would support. So for example, one of them would be a high occupancy toll on lanes or express lanes on the highways, like 400 series highways, for example, in the greater Toronto Hamilton area. Would you support um, a utility bill level? Would you consider a congestion levy, a congestion tax? Would you consider an employer payroll tax in areas with high, higher order transit, transit service? How about an HST revenue from gas or diesel sales tax? 
revenue dedicated partially or fully to Greater Toronto Hamilton Transit. Another option is a value capture levy. So this provides revenue from higher property values for taxes in areas served by higher order transit. A property tax uplift, this was something that Councillor Stintz suggested as part of the one city approach. And of course, there are councillors who are talking about working with the private sector, doing private public partnerships. This, I, I remind you, is, is, is a mechanism, but it's not a revenue tool itself. It's just a way to build transit that can often cut costs. Are there other ideas that you have in mind for where we can find funds? My, my bottom line belief on this all is this. When we go to Torontonians, or if we go to Torontonians and residents in the regions, and if you just say, would you like to pay another tax? <laughs> would you like to have less money in your pocket? Would you like to pay tolls? And then we don't tell them where it's going to go or what it's for, or you just use a generic term like better transit. People wonder, is, you know, is, I work so hard for my money, and I've got so little of it left. And you just want me to put it into this endless black hole of government. Um, a lot of people say no. I ask you this though. If government, whether it be the city or provincial government, or Metrolinx, was able to say, we're going to give you a receipt. We're going to build you this line. We're going to give you these kilometers of subway that's going to connect A to B to C. We're going to be able to build you something concrete and clear that will substantively improve your quality of life. This is exactly how much it will cost for this period of time, and we need to be held to account as we progress. Is that something that would make more sense to you? From what I hear from many residents, the answer is yes, but I'm a little cynical. I've seen government sort of mess up on projects before. You need to demonstrate to me that you're going to spend the money wisely, thoughtfully, and things are going to be on budget on time. So those are some of the questions that I ask you, you to consider. So I'm going to introduce our guests. Service planning strategy um, and from the service planning department of the Toronto Transit Commission. Well, from Metrolinx, we're going to hear an update from Jamie Robinson, Director of Community Relations and Communications, Toronto Transit Projects. I also want to thank TTC and Metrolinx for being next to each other in the same room working together. <laughs> um, after, after Jamie, we're going to hear from Steve Monroe, who sometimes is referred to as an advocate, some refer to him as an expert, and others refer to him as a transit guru. Steve, um, Steve uh, knows a lot about the history of transit, where we've gone right, where we've gone wrong too often, and he'll give us an overview of where we are today. Thank you, Steve. We'll next hear from Richard Joy, VP Policy and Government Relations for Toronto Board of Trade. A member of Along with People, Goods and Services need good transit too. And the better transit we have, the more able we're able, we're, we're able as drivers to be able to get around the road as well. It's good for us all. And last, but far from least, a very uh, well-known uh, transit advocate, somebody who has been going on tour everywhere these days advocating for a regional plan that will improve transit for all of us, the former chief planner of the City of Toronto, Paul Bedford. <laughs> After we hear from our panelists, um, we're going to go into a question and answer a session, and we're going to try a novel approach to it. You've heard some of my opinions and my editorial about where I, need, where I believe we need to go. Downtown Relief Line, real rapid transit to our Pearson International Airport, improved transit for all corners of the city, and a realistic way to pay for it where we can demonstrate that we're going to get things done on time, on budget, and a way that people know that we're actually getting it done and that money is being spent on it. But what we're going to hear from our panels today is absolutely uneditorialized information. In other words, their perspectives based on evidence, based on facts, what they know to be true, and they're going to share it with you. When you speak, you are welcome to say anything you'd like with regard to transit and your vision for transit, or ask questions of all of us. 
You can be on any side of the coin. You can have any opinion you want. This is about making sure that you, as you form your opinions, make informed opinions, because I know that our community wants to have the information that they deserve to be able to support what they believe is best for our city. So with no further ado, I'd like to welcome Bill Dawson from the Toronto Transit Commission. Thank you very much, Councilman. Um, and I'm certainly glad to see that uh, we have the, uh, the, uh, the picture working properly because uh, I have some graphs and things that would desperately need to uh, be very difficult to, to explain. Um, So, uh, Count Councillor Mattel asked me to talk specifically, kick this off, because there's going to be a lot of issues that come up uh, with all the different panelists, but um, I thought that perhaps, and he thought that it would be good if I could just talk initially about optimizing existing subway capacity. I mean, that, that's a starting point, and as he said, um, there really are some uh, issues, significant issues related to the young subway, which if you use it, you know and experience every day, you see it, we see it, we know it. There are also some things that we're doing that are going to make a, a lot of difference in the next couple of years, and I'll describe those to you. Um, it, but it, and it certainly is the first step. We should be, as taxpayers, wanting to optimize the infrastructure the best we can before we start going out and spending a lot of money on new infrastructure. So we as CDC have been focusing on this in the last decade, and I think you'll see some of the results. Young is a core of our system, and it is operating over capacity. Um, just by way of background, um, just a reminder, we, are, we carry 830,000 passengers a day on the subway. Um, young, young subway uh, between Edmonton and Southern Blue is by far the busiest section of the subway line. This is a, a, a graph that shows passengers on the subway every 15 minutes, starting at 6 in the morning through till 10 in the morning, to show you how the peaking occurs during the, during the day. And uh, you will see that at, from about 7.45 in the, in the morning till quarter after nine, <coughs> we, are, we are carrying in the order of 6,000 passengers every 15 minutes. And in fact, that, that really is the, the limit of our train capacity. And so when we go over that, that what would be a red line of, with a different color scheme, uh, <laughs> would, uh, shows the capacity of the trains that we're operating today, and uh, it certainly we'll break that capacity for, and then when you get to about between 8.15 and 8.30, we are consistently over capacity. And what that means is that when you go down to a train, there's going to be significant numbers of times where you'll have to wait two or three trains to get on the train. And from an operations point of view, it creates, it's very difficult to operate because a very full train means that it takes longer to load and unload and we have problems with stuck doors and all of these other things. So it is operating past anything that we would normally consider acceptable. We are doing three different things and I'll talk about each one of them. New Toronto rocket trains, hopefully you've seen some of them. We're, we're, we're implementing automatic train control. And the Toronto York Spadina subway extension will have a small benefit to the young side of the subway line. First, Toronto rocket trains. Uh, we've started receiving these earlier this year. We now have, I think, about 20 in operation. Uh, we're getting 70 new trains. They are this uh, uh, walk-through gangway design where you can, with uh, more space and space available that wasn't available on earlier trains. They have a higher capacity. And the other thing from our point of view is they'll be much more reliable. So this is just a picture of that, of that open concept and uh, uh, providing more capacity and easier flow through for passengers. Uh, some key design things about the Toronto Rocket, they're the six-car unit trains, so they stay as six-car trains all the way. Open gangways, full width cabs at the front of the operator. Wheelchair accessibility, there's a, a, a detraining ramp at the front and the back for wheelchairs in case of emergency. There's information systems on the vehicle, active group map, station data, audio visual, CCTV. They'll be much more reliable, we're very confident of that. About a 10% increase in capacity, there's just 10% more room on them than our current trains. Improved energy consumption and some significant improvements related to things like evacuation and some fire safety issues that we have. <coughs> 
So, so that's a, a significant investment that we're making, the city's making, uh, you as taxpayers are making to improve the uh, subway. The next step is our signaling system. In fact, the signaling system is the limiting factor <coughs> with the number of trains we can operate today. The reason why we can only run trains for 6,000 people and not seven or 8,000 is because of the signaling system. And the signaling system is the thing that keeps safe, safe safety space between trains during operation. And the signaling system we run now is the system that was put in place in 1954. It is now, it was uh, state-of-the-art technology 70 years ago, and it is no longer. Uh, and, and, and I mean, this is a fundamental problem we have from state of good repair. You, you talk about things like uh, infrastructure deficit. Well, it, it's real. The, the really other things that we all know we could improve and should improve, but it's just very difficult to come up with the funding and the system to be able to do it. These are just some pictures that uh, you'll see a, 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 a 1950s control board down there that's currently still in use. Uh, this is a, a switching gear and some cracked wiring in the system. This system desperately needs replacement. So these state-of-the-art internationally, and we've done a lot of work on identifying what is best practice, and automatic train control is the way to go. A computerized system for controlling train movements that increases capacity, we can run more trains per hour, reducing headways, improves speed adherence, and it addresses both that state of good repair, getting this system up to a safe and reasonable level, and capacity issues. The resignaling is underway right now. It will be a long job because you have to replace every signal in the system. In fact, you see there's been some weekend closures of the subway. That's specifically to put in some crossovers that are needed for this system. So that's part of the implementation of the new signal. Uh, uh, three components, automatic train operation. So the train operates automatically. The, the driver will no longer start and stop the train and open and close the doors. Increased capacity, smooth ride, better passenger comfort, uh, one person operation. We have, we have a centralized control system. We'll have a lot more tools to manage events if there's an emergency on the system. And automatic train protection. That's the thing that keeps safe distance between trains. Uh, is is a, a much improved over the last 50 years. Um, so that's, that was sector number two. And the number three is the Toronto Subway subway extension to Vaughan. And if you recall, this is the line that is extending up to York University and into Vaughan. There's a, a significant number of passengers up on, along Steeles and Finch and into York Region who currently take buses over to the Young Subway, the Finch Subway Station, and come south. And these people are desperately looking forward to the subway line opening up so they get a quicker trip south on the University line, and it will free up space on the Young Line. So when this um, uh, line opens, which is, it says completion 2015, in fact I believe we've now, just as of a day or two ago, decided that it's going to be 2016, well, when it opens, it will be, uh, it will have an effect on capacity. So, just a, a, a quick, quick uh, rundown. Uh, relieving on some congestion, new Toronto rocket trains, complete by 2015, nine, uh, $950 million to purchase those trains, plus 10% capacity, plus a whole bunch of other Automatic train control, re-signaling is completed by 2016, a $400 million project. Opportunity for 35% increase in capacity, you have to buy more trains progressively to get there. We are purchasing some more trains. And then the TYSSE diversion of the University line. So in total, it was about a 30 or 40 percent opportunity to increase capacity, which is, is very low. I think the obvious question is, will this be enough? And, and, and I'll, I'll just give you a quick take on it. You'll wait, probably hear more from other speakers. We, the, uh, you'll have heard about the Downtown Rapid Transit Expansion Study, which was released on Thursday and is going to the Commission on Wednesday. I'll distill it down to some very simple things related to the Young Subway. Improved capacity, we think, will, will uh, address the forecast growth for 10 to 15 years. And that includes an assumption about the Eglinton LRT being in operation. Now, it doesn't include an extension to the north, to uh, Richmond Hill. And that's a very contentious issue. The extension to the north to Richmond Hill would attract so many riders to the young subway that basically it would use up all that spare capacity. And so it would be close to capacity on opening day if we extended 
the subway to Richmond Hill, and no capability for future growth. So the report recommends that the Commission and Council continue its position that this young subway not be extended to Richmond Hill until some other action is taken to improve capacity into the downtown. So new rapid transit into the downtown is needed before an orderly extension of the young line and will be needed in 10 or 15 years regardless. So I'll stop there uh, and leave it to perhaps my other panelists to comment on, on, on some of those, uh, the situation we're in. Thank you, Council. Then we will be speaking to the, uh, the Edmonton Cross Town as well. Thank you. Uh, PowerPoint slides up and running. I, I don't know what I would have done if I didn't have a little bit of a backdrop here. It's interesting to note, though, when you see them up here, that uh, uh, my colleague and, and friend from the TTC said, you know, the slides look a little green here. They look a little like they're all metro <laughs> <laughs> and, and I said that, I said, no, no, listen to what uh, Councillor Mattel said. He said, you guys are all working together and how great that is. And so that's, <laughs> that's important to that. So, nope. Um, I, a good evening, uh, uh, Councillor Mattel, ladies and gentlemen. and. Uh, uh, fellow panelists. Um, I want to first of all thank Councilman Mattel for putting this uh, uh, transit uh, forum together. I think that uh, if we all uh, think about all the emails and reports and uh, uh, tweets and twitters and uh, things that we're getting uh, every day ourselves, we're writing about, we're reading about, um, I think that uh, it's, it's safe to say that, uh, that transit is a very, very important issue for Toronto and the greater uh, Hamilton area as, as well as. Um, uh, as well as this, uh, this community. I think, as uh, uh, Councilor Madden also said, that there's a broad uh, public uh, agreement that the status quo is, is no longer an option and that we need better, uh, more and integrated uh, public transit in the greater uh, Toronto and Hamilton area. On behalf of Metrolinks, I'm, I'm uh, pleased to report that progress is being made. Uh, the shovels are underground and, and, and work is proceeding and that today we've got over $16 billion worth of projects that are already completed or underway. I've been asked to focus uh, my attention and my presentation this evening on an update of the uh, uh, Metrolinx LRT projects in, in Toronto. Um, and it's certainly my pleasure to, uh, to do that. Um, very soon people are going to see a lot of activity along Eglinton Avenue um, as we begin to build the Crosstown project. This is going to be exciting for all of us and, and, and certainly there's going to be disruption, there's, there's no question about that. But we're going to do everything possible, but uh, we, we can't mitigate this, the disruption while well, reminding folks that at the end of the day, when the project is completed, that we're going to have a system that is safe, reliable, affordable, convenient, and comfortable. So just in terms of the subjects I want to cover here is that I'm going to just provide an overview of the uh, LRD projects in the Toronto and talk about the project schedule. It, does, it, it has shifted a bit um, over the past period of time, so I want to make sure that people are uh, uh, familiar with that. I'll talk uh, very briefly uh, about each of the individual projects, spending a little bit more time on the Edmonton Chronic Town, because I know that that's what uh, uh, most of the folks in this room are, are interested in. Um, i show you a couple of uh, pictures of, of an LRT vehicle, um, just so that people can get a sense. Not everyone has, has seen an LRT vehicle, and as I was very like to say, when people see it, it's often not what, not what they uh, think of what they think it is, or, or that what, they, uh, uh, what they've been told it is. I um, want to talk uh, for just for a minute or so on the, the agreement that we uh, uh, reached uh, with the uh, Toronto Transit Commission recently with respect to uh, the operation of the, uh, uh, the LRT uh, uh, system moving forward. And then just talk uh, briefly about uh, the Crosstown team and sort of how the work uh, is being done with respect to uh, the work here by Metrolinx. So this is a, a map that I'm sure folks are uh, familiar with. So you can see the four uh, uh, Toronto Transit projects. Um, we have the, uh, and uh, I can't talk the colors because again they all have that green view to them. So, uh, <laughs> the, actually, there is the, the orange line here, which is the Eglinton Crosstown, um, and uh, the solid uh, is is where the um, uh, the project would be would be at grade. Uh, tunnel is, is the uh, area that's uh, marked with uh, dashes there. Uh, the other project, in, in, which you can probably see in green, is the uh, Scarborough uh, Rapid Transit uh, uh, replacement. You have Finch West LRT and then the Shepherd uh, the East LRT. In terms of project schedule, um, we have the Edmonton uh, uh, Crosstown project, which is uh, which we've begun and uh, which will be finished in uh, in 2020. 
We have the Scarborough RT, which is uh, going to begin in 2014 and uh, go to 2020. <laughs> this is the Shepherd uh, Maintenance Facility, and uh, work begins uh, uh, 2014 and uh, goes into uh, close to 2017. We have the, uh, the Shepherd uh, uh, LRT, which uh, construction will begin in 2017 and be finished in 2021. And then you have the Finch uh, LRT, which is uh, 2015 to 2020. So very specifically with respect to each of these, uh, each of these projects, um, the Edmonton Crosstown is a $4.9 billion uh, project um, funded by the province of Ontario, as, as all these are. Um, it's 19 kilometers uh, east to west from, uh, uh, from Kennedy uh, to Jane and Black Creek, and including uh, 10 kilometers of, uh, of tunnel. Um, there will be connections to the Young University Spadina Subway, the Scarborough Rapid Transit, and, uh, and the Go uh, Station, the Go uh, System going up to Scoville. And along the whole line, will be up to 26 uh, stations. That's uh, the map of the, uh, the Edmonton Crosstown, so you can see all the, uh, the stations that are, uh, that are listed there. I did visual with that. A um, few things on Edmonton Crosstown. So uh, design and engineering west of Black Creek is, uh, is underway, including the west maintenance and, uh, and storage facility. Uh, back in September, um, the Metro Lane's Board of Directors approved uh, the, uh, the tunneling contract, which is uh, the tunneling work that will be done from uh, the west part of uh, uh, the, uh, the system at, uh, at Black Creek over to uh, Young Eglinton. That's a $320 million contract. Uh, so the work was awarded in September and we're going to uh, be doing work. The uh, tunneling will begin in uh, early 2013. So the tunneling uh, is in, uh, uh, call it different phases, but it's first of all we've got uh, Keel to Allen, which, is, uh, which will begin, as I said, spring 2013 and extend to spring 2014. <laughs> And then Allen uh, to Young, which is the summer of uh, 2014 to early 2016. So during this whole period of time, there's going to be an awful lot of work along uh, this part of uh, Edmonton. Um, we have uh, a lot of work in particular that gets done at the, uh, the Edmonton West uh, Station. We've got uh, utilities uh, relocation, um, uh, which is uh, getting, getting in earnest in, in February and uh, until July of uh, next year. Um, we have to construct an extraction staff um, uh, from July to December in, in 2013 because basically what we're doing is we're running the tunneling along to the, uh, to the, to the existing subway and we've got to pull the tunnels out and then uh, put them down on the other side where they'll continue on to, uh, to Young Street. That's so we don't uh, disrupt the, uh, uh, the, uh, the subway. And then, so then the tunnel boring machine extraction will, will take place in, uh, in 2014 at the uh, Edmonton Station. This just gives you a sense of uh, the, the size of what the uh, uh, tunnels are going to look like. You can see the, uh, uh, the gentleman down in there, so the size, pure size of the, uh, the, what the tunnels will look like and the uh, tunnel boring machines. Um, this gives you a sense of uh, the, some of the challenges that uh, we're going to be facing when we do begin the tunneling. These will be the, these will be the uh, various work with the various utilities that we're going to find underneath the, uh, uh, when we begin the tunnel. A lot of the work that has to be done to uh, relocate those utilities so the work can uh, proceed uh, as expeditiously as possible. Um, with respect to the Scarborough RT, um, it's a uh, $1.8 billion project, again funded by the province. It's the conversion of the uh, uh, existing rapid transit uh, uh, system in Scarborough to uh, uh, light, rail, uh, light rail transit. And then uh, as well, there'll be a 3.7 kilometer extension from uh, the, the end of the, the current line up to the Eglinton <laughs> Avenue. There will be connections to the existing Lord Dam for a subway, the future Shepherd East, and as well the Eglinton Crosstown uh, LRT, and it goes still the up to eight stations on that uh, on Scarborough T. Shepherd Ave East, that's a $950 million project. Um, uh, it's two thirds funded by the province of Ontario and one third by the, uh, by the federal government. It's 13 kilometers of uh, light rail transit from uh, Don Mills uh, Station to Morningside. <coughs> It'll be connected to the uh, Shepherd Subway to Scarborough RT and uh, the GOAT uh, uh, system uh, going up to Stolo. And there'll be up to 28 stations on that. And finally, we've got the Finch West LRT, where there's a, which is a $1.8 billion project. Um, one kilometer of LRT from the future, uh, sorry, 11 kilometers of uh, light rail transit from the future uh, Finch West uh, station over at Humber College. And it'll be connected to the uh, Young University Spadina Subway. And it'll be up to 19 stations along that, that uh, 
Uh, just to give you a, a picture of uh, what uh, the LRT vehicles are. I'm not sure that uh, folks have seen them, but uh, we uh, these are uh, being built by Bombardier, and uh, we had an opportunity to put one down at the exhibition uh, during the uh, uh, during the whole run of the CNE this year, right in front of the Direct Energy Centre. And, and again, we had uh, a lot of people that uh, came in and, uh, and saw the vehicle, had their pictures taken, uploaded our Facebook page. And again, I think that the, primarily the thing that uh, we did hear from a lot of people again was it, it's not what we thought it was, it's not what we, we may have been told it was. And uh, they were really excited by, by what it looks like. We're going to be moving the, uh, the mock-up vehicle around to various places. It's spent uh, after the CNE, it's been down at the Brickworks, uh, which is down at uh, Pottery Road and, uh, in Bayview. And uh, for example, we're looking at an opportunity to put, uh, put it out in front of the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Edmonton to West Subway Station. I mean, just so people can get a sense of what's taking place and that uh, there is uh, there is movement. Just to give you a flavor of some of the uh, details on it, um, it's a, a fast boarding um, with uh, with a low floor across it. Um, uh, it's uh, zero emissions on the street, and you've got a flexibility that you can add uh, different amounts of vehicles depending on capacity requirements. But uh, certainly, have two or three vehicles that are there. Um, we run on dedicated transit lines, there will be trans transit signal coordination, and uh, um, operational speed is, will be up to the uh, posted limit. So again, it's, uh, uh, what we like to say is that uh, at the end of it, what folks are going to see is fast, reliable, accessible, comfortable, sustainable, and cost-effective uh, LRTs. Um, one of the issues that's got a lot of attention, of course, recently that uh, folks have heard about in the news is, is uh, our agreement with the, uh, that was reached uh, recently with the uh, Toronto Transit Commission and, and Metrolinx, where we uh, reached an agreement for uh, the Toronto Transit Commission to operate the four LRT vehicles in, in Toronto under contract to Metrolinx. So the TTC is going to drive the vehicles, they're going to provide security and uh, revenue control, and they're going to staff the stations to achieve uh, higher levels of customer satisfaction. The initial operating agreement that uh, will take place between uh, Metrolinx and the TTC will uh, be for 10 years, um, for a 10 year period. And all maintenance um, will be undertaken by the design, build, finance, and maintain contractor that uh, we're going to be initiating a process at Metrolinx uh, early in 2013 to uh, find that private sector partner to work with us on that, uh, that element of the project. Uh, with respect to the operating agreement, um, uh, I think it's, there's a lot of uh, really positive discussion that's taking place with the, uh, with the, between the Metrolinx and the TTC. We do share the same objectives of delivering safe, um, effective and integrated transit services and providing seamless customer experience. That's very, very important to us. Um, and the operating agreement uh, between the TTC and Metrolink, so it's almost like the, 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 the easy part's over is reaching this, this uh, operating agreement right now. It's, been, it's a lot of the, the hard work that begins now to reach the finalized operating agreement that uh, said we'll have in place the, uh, two years before the system is in, and the, the lines begin to uh, uh, be operational. And that's going to address issues that are important to uh, both Metrolink and the TTC, including uh, uh, fare box sharing, uh, fares and operating subsidies that will be uh, existing on these lines uh, if, uh, if required. Um, just uh, briefly, <coughs> um, we're uh, one of the things that we've we've had to do at Metrolinx here is that uh, uh, prior to um, uh, the last few months is that the uh, the TTC was doing all the work with respect to the community relations activities on the uh, on the Edmonton uh, uh, Crosstown project and all the LRT projects. And, um, and but now it's it's Metrolinx, and so uh, we've been fortunate to have a couple of folks, uh, Frank and uh, and uh, Denise, who've um, uh, come over from the TTC. Folks who've had an opportunity to visit our, our Dufferin uh, uh, office will have met some of these uh, met these two individuals. You're going to see a lot of them as we begin to uh, build the projects. Um, and uh, Mark is uh, joining as well. And then we've got a team that uh, um, a small team right now, but beginning to staff up at. Uh, 5160 Young, it really supports all the work that's going to be done in the field with the, uh, the uh, community relations team there. Um, if I get two minutes, or just going to run a quick video here. <coughs> Metro Lakes is moving ahead on the Edmonton Crosstown LRT project. Part of the province's $8.4 billion investment in transit expansion for Toronto. Construction will begin by digging tunnels that will carry the future Crosstown vehicles. The project will run underground through the city centre. 
from west of Keel Street to Rare Drive. The tunnels will be constructed by large tunnel boring machines, or TBMs for short. The crosstown TBMs will be over 80 meters long. Excavation of the lock shaft, where tunneling will begin, is already underway between Black Creek Drive and Keel Street. The TBMs will be assembled in the launch shaft and will bore the first section of tunnels to Allen Road. TBMs operate deep below the surface, and there should be no discernible impact to properties from tunnel boring. Regular monitoring of boring activity will be undertaken. The TBMs will drill their way eastward, creating tunnels six and a half meters in diameter at a rate of about 10 meters per day. The spores of the building will be collected by the TBM and carried back in a conveyor belt, then loaded from the rail cars and transported to the launch shaft at Keelsville Park. There, they will be lifted out and stored for later removal. Trucks will pick up the material and carry it out for reuse. The volume of material to be excavated for the crosstown tunnels will be enormous. Enough <coughs> material will be removed to fill the Air Canada Centre Ring to a height of 580 meters. Precast concrete ladders will be placed on the tunnel walls as the TBM drives through. The TBM propels itself forward by pushing on these newly installed concrete panels. At future station locations, the head walls for the station box will be excavated and poured first. Then the TBMs will drill right through the concrete walls. The station box will be excavated during a later phase of the project. When they reach Edmonton West Station, the TBMs will be extracted using a shaft located just west of Allen Road. This will allow the TTC to maintain existing subway service throughout construction and optimize the connection between the new LRT and the subway. The TBMs will be refurbished and reinstalled on Eglinton, just east of Allen Road for the second phase of tunneling to Young Street. After the tunnel excavation is complete, tracks and other utilities will be constructed inside the new tunnels. During the later stages of station excavation and construction, traffic along these sections of Eglinton will be limited to one lane in each direction for an extended period of time. The project will eventually carry vehicles that will move to Ontonians across the city more widely and comfortably, and in half the time as with current options. If you would like more information about the crosstown, please give us a call, drop by our community office, or visit our website at crosstown.ca.
entire network, well, half of the network just fell off the map, and the other half has been delayed many years beyond its original uh, proposed ending date. Um, frankly, given the political leanings of the province and where things are going, I would be very surprised if a lot of the stuff that's on the Metrolinx map actually gets built. And that's not a very nice thing to say, but there's only so much money to go around. Uh, and that brings me to the issue of funding, which Paul will talk about in more detail later. Um, it's very important, uh, it's kind of interesting, you know, the, there's been all the talk of Metrolinx having an investment strategy, and the, and the fact, one of the most important things is we need to think about building transit networks, not just building the one line we can afford for the next decade, but actually building a network that moves people around the city. It would be kind of like building the Don Valley Parkway and stopping and saying, okay, what do we do now? Um, road net, roads, people drive on networks. They don't drive on individual roads. In the same way, transit use cannot be handled simply by building one line here and there. And yet, because of the financial situation, increasingly we're hearing line-oriented debates. Um, I mean, ironically, it's, it's so funny that with the release of the downtown relief line study last week, suddenly everybody's talking about the downtown relief line. And we have to have it right now or the world will end. <laughs> and I was sent an interesting clipping from the star by Mike Filey, who many of you probably know, over the weekend. And it was dated December 1982. 30 years ago, and the then Chief General Manager of TTC, Elf Savage, was talking about the downtown relief line, and how if we did not have this in at the absolute outside 10 years, downtown would come to a complete stop. Okay, so you may have noticed downtown did not come to a complete stop. It's still there, it's still there. And of course, the reason it is, is that people get into downtown by many different means. The growth in downtown uh, office employment has largely been taken up by Go Transit rather than by the TTC. Also, conveniently, although I, I dare say a lot of people wouldn't look at it this way, but conveniently for Toronto, there was a recession in the early 1990s. And the result was the TTC lost 20% of its traction. So that gave them a bit of breathing space for capacity on the transit system as a whole and subway in particular. The problem is we have been back to the point we were around 1990 when the TTC had its last high water mark for ridership. And we've broken through that line and we're over 10% above that high water mark now. But so we're basically in the same period that Al Savage was worried about 30 years ago that he needed the downtown relief line yesterday. The problem is all the focus is on building subway lines in Scarborough and in North York and anywhere but downtown Toronto. Um, that's a very difficult situation to be in because yes, people in the suburbs need rapid transit too, but the problem is downtown doesn't go away. Um, for its part, Go Transit, and I'm not sure really this is as much Go Transit's fault specifically as it is a provincial government fault. Go has some wonderful plans for expanding transit service in the region. And indeed, if you look at the Big Move plan, you'll see much, much improved Go train service all over uh, southern Ontario. The problem is it's all subject to funding. And you may have noticed the province is feeling kind of poorly these days. Uh, frankly, they've been feeling poorly for a couple of decades, and Go Transit, Go Transit basically, when someone comes along to them and says, hey, we want you to spend some money, say, we just want to keep the trains we've got on the road, never mind expanding here, there, and everywhere. So there's a really big problem at the provincial level with underfunding, not just of transit locally, but transit on a regional basis. Another important point, when Paul starts talking about the various ways that that we could pick you up by the legs and shake small change out of your pockets in the hope that that will pay for our transit system, <coughs> is that a lot of the focus has been on capital construction, building new lines like the Eglinton Crosstown line, um, expanding your transit, what I was just talking about. But there is a very substantial need for funding the system we've already got. Just this year, uh, the TTC's budget ask 
for their just their operating budget, just the money it takes to run the transit process back and forth and, and clean and maintain the vehicles, will probably go up on the order of $40 million to city council. That's just to stay where they are today and absorb the ride ship increases that they're getting. That makes no provision for undoing the service cuts that were made over the last two years so that they could get by with the budget cuts that Rob Ford implemented. Um, it also, there's also a problem that the TTC requires on the order of $800 million to $1 billion a year for capital maintenance. That's new buses, new subway trains, uh, major repairs to the system like the tunnel repairs that are going on in North Bayblinton. Um, that's completely separate from any money to build new lines. Uh, that kind of funding used to come both from the city, from the province, from the feds, but a lot of the programs at the provincial and federal level that funded it have over the years been cut back, and one by one they're dying off, and more and more of that cost is falling to the city budget. It's a major problem for the city's capital financing. So enough about money. And I talked about Metrolinks, which I, I could talk about for a long time. My, my basic complaint about Metrolinks is that they don't pay enough. They're a regional transit agency, but uh, there's a lot more that they could be doing if only regional transit were properly funded. Uh, finally, as, as I mentioned, the downtown relief line has suddenly become flavor of the day again. It's not something that we can afford to let fall off the map, as so many other things have come along and, and vanished. Because, as I said, we now are looking at ridership growth passing anything that, that Toronto has seen. And there needs to be more capacity in the downtown. If anything, the problem is that phase one that the TTC is proposing is a comparatively small line from St. Andrews subway station at King and University, east and north to Pitt and Danford. That's 3.2 billion to do build a subway that long. And frankly, I don't think that's enough because if you're going to really talk about providing relief into the downtown, the line has to go further north, at least to Eglinton, uh, so that it becomes an attractive parallel service to the other subway to bring people into downtown. That, of course, means even more money. And, you know, I may still be alive to ride the train. <laughs> so, I hope you don't take that long to build it. You know, we can get the whole sort of TTC retirees club out to drive the first thing. I remember when this was just a plan. <laughs> that's, that's the problem. So much of what we've seen, I mean, I've got 40-year-old Presto babies that have all of this stuff in them that have lines to the airport. You know, there was a plan in the 60s to build a line to the airport. I don't know if any of you, how well do you know Kipling Station Bus Terminal? All the buses line up along the north side of Kipling Station Bus Terminal. If you look carefully on the other side, there's a nice long glass wall with nothing behind it but a very long, smooth platform. And that's where the line to the airport was supposed to be when the Kipling extension opened. So uh, for those of you who have been waiting to get to the airport, you can just stand there with your transfer. <laughs> Josh, Josh made those nice slides sometime in the back of the area. So, so, so as I said, in, in a way, I, I, I come here partly to rain on the parade, but partly to bring a sense of the, the, the context in which a lot of this debate happens. We're talking about a huge amount of money during a period when all governments, the one thing they don't have is money, and they have taxpayers who are really, really unhappy anytime someone says, give me more. So the problem is, you know, whatever we're going to do, justifying it, and then sticking with the plan so that we don't, you know, get halfway done, and as we did on Edmonton once before, and, and stop before the lights really got started. So with that, I'll pass back to John. Because you've heard a lot about different ideas. I'm not talking about choices, but I can talk about the consequences of those choices. And we all know when you make a choice every day or in life, there's a consequence. So we'll go that way, this way. And often I find that people just talk about choices. They don't talk about the consequences. So that's what we're going to focus on. Go ahead. These are the three things I want to talk about. 
You've heard a lot of, I'll go over this quickly, state of transportation today, what are the major challenges, and then I really want to drill down on the proposed solutions. So you've heard a lot about problems. Thanks. Everybody knows this, the 401 congestion, Board of Trade estimates $6 billion lost to the economy every year. We'll project it. If we do nothing, that, that figure will rise to $15 billion of lost productivity in the next 20 years. Next. Here's the, the state of the, the region as we know it, the Greater Toronto Hamilton area today. Roughly 6 million people, going to grow to about 9 million, maybe 10 million in the next 20 years. 30 municipalities, four levels of government, 10 transit agencies in a big, big geographic area. And the, the thing that's really important about that is there's a bit of a debate that has always been there. Should the City of Toronto kind of go it alone or do we have to do this as a region? And my view, very strongly, is we're all in this together. People live and work in different parts of that region every single day. They cross those borders. They don't even know where they are. We're one big region. So we've got to get our act together as a region. Next. Here's one of my favorites. This is how you move 40 people. There's the exact same number of people in each of those three slides. One person per car, one person per chair sitting on the street, and one lone streetcar with nobody on the street. And the point of that slide is we've got to get real here. We have to use the road space we have far more effectively. Because you can move a hell of a lot more people in even streetcars than you can one person per car. That is a powerful slide. Remember I showed that to Mel last one. He was the mayor. He looked at it and he said, oh, okay, I think I get it. But what the hell are they sitting on the road for? <laughs> Powerful. This is a cartoon that illustrates the number of people that go through Union Station every day by GO, by TPC, on foot, via rail, taxi, the whole ball of wax. You would need 72 lanes of expressway to equal that number. The point of that slide is the only way for us to go in the future is to invest heavily in a transit network of all types. I'm going to talk about that. Thanks. It's not so bad, you have to push the streetcar. <laughs> and the reality is, many of you, I've done it, many of you have, you know, Toronto has, thank God, because of Steve here, he saved Toronto's streetcar network 40 years ago. <laughs> thank God he did, because I want to tell you something. In terms of the 11 streetcar routes that we have throughout the city, you all know where they are, Collectively, they carry far more riders per day than the entire GTHA regional GO system. Just those 11 streetcars. I'm not counting buses, subways, nothing. Streetcars are damn important to the city. Now, here's what we've heard from people all throughout the region. They want more choice, they want smarter choices, obviously. You gotta focus on moving people, not vehicles. Land use and transportation go together like a hand in glove. And this also is not only residential, but where people work. And obviously, you want to have tra traveler-oriented lines, as Steve says. You're building a network. People want to go north, south, east, west, on a diagonal throughout this region. And that's, what, that's the challenge we have ahead of us. So these are the areas we have to focus on. Next. OK, we all know we've seen this. We need more of everything. It's my short answer to you today. We've got to figure out how to pay for it. We've got to get real here. So yes, nice new subway cars. We, you've already heard you know, from, from Bill in terms of the ridership statistics that we're going to go way, way up in terms of the need for more subway lines. We need, I would rename the downtown relief line. I call it the suburban relief line. Because as Steve said, it should go all the way up to Eglinton to the crosstown at either end. And that, again, expands that network. Next. This is a slide I took that was out last summer in Edmonton. This is their LRT underground in downtown Edmonton. Some of you, I'm sure, have ridden it. Next. This is the Calgary system, the surface system at Grayton, the city hall stop. Uh, you know, these western cities have had these facilities for decades. We are so far behind here, it's pathetic. And we've been resting on our laurels, in my opinion, and it's time to you know, get our act together. Next. The streetcars, as I said. This is, the, of course, the Spadina streetcar. Many of you ride it or are familiar with it. 
And even though it's out of commission right now because of the reconstruction on Queens Key, I want to give you a very important figure here. That streetcar line carries 52,000 people a day. Anybody want to guess how many people ride on the Shepherd subway every day? 47,700. <laughs> One streetcar line carries more than the whole Shepherd subway. And we got to be smart about, yes, we need more subways, no question. Well, we've got to put them in the right kind of place. And, and we also need more LRT lines. And we need more streetcar service. And then we need all-day GO train service. And we need electrification of the whole GO network. And we need that rapid transit connection to the airport that we'll get into, I'm sure, in questions next. Here's an example of a new streetcar out in uh, Portland, uh, Oregon. Uh, many of you may have been there. Fabulous what they've done. Next. Here's a slide I took in Mexico City not too long ago in terms of bus rapid transit. You know, Mexico City is a huge metropolitan area, 25 million people. They have a phenomenal subway network, but they also are building 11 new bus rapid transit lines. Why? Because they're affordable, they work great, they carry a huge volume of people at relatively low expense. And I think we need all types of transit throughout this region for all those reasons. Next. Now, here's, uh, I, I continue to write even though I've been retired from City Hall for quite a while. So this is an article I wrote for the Star a while ago. And, and in February 2011, and uh, I used the example of the uh, Spadina streetcar in comparison to Shepherd Subway. And I asked a very serious question here. I said, is progressive city planning possible under Mayor Ford and the current Toronto City Council? I went on to say, it's not just an option, it's absolute necessity. And we got to make sure, you collectively, and everybody in the city in this region have to make sure this happens. Thanks. Now here's what you've seen before. This is a couple of years ago. Boy, this is like an old movie. <laughs> <laughs> the, the fact of the matter is, this is you know, what you've already heard here described tonight. But, you know, we stopped, we paused, we debated, we thought. We went around and around in circles. And finally, where are we now? We're back to this. <laughs> and we lost two years of endless talk. And I think, you know, you've heard Eglinton Crosstown. Yeah, no question, needed. Glad it's finally happening. Finch LRT, again, just that Finch West bus carries 43,000 people a day on the bus on, fin on the Finch corridor. That, that, that is a positive step. And the Shepherd East LRT and the Scarborough Arts and Replacement. I can't resist, I have to say this. My own personal view is that I think there's an enormous amount of merit instead of taking the RT out of commission for four or five years and, and rebuilding it as an LRT. Just extend the subway from Kennedy straight to the Scarborough Town Center and you wouldn't lose the service. And quite frankly, I think it'd be very cost effective, the biggest bang for the buck. Anyway, that's an aside. Next. Here, here's a map that you, you probably can't see from the back, but it's okay, because I'm going to tell you about it. This is an important map in the official plan called right-of-way widths. And you can see, generally, there's different colors up here. And I'll just tell you what the code is. The normal city of Toronto right-of-way, like out here on Young Street, is 20 meters, 66 feet. But that's not what we see throughout the whole city. It goes anywhere from 20 all the way to 45 meters and even over that. Point of that is there, there are many streets that can easily accommodate an LRT, uh, expanded streetcar service in the middle of that right away and still maintain all adequate traffic conditions. And we have to look at this as not one size, you know, sort of satisfies everything. We need different solutions for different parts of the city. Next. Here's a quick example of what you'll probably see up on Highway 7 with the bus rapid transit line at York Viva, the Viva bus service. This is what the Finch LRT would probably look like at the Shepherd LRT. Uh, and finally, we're going to obviously move those three forward. Next. And to cross time, you've already heard all this, so I won't repeat it. Uh, I'm glad it's happening. I think, you know, that, uh, that, that, that it's long, long overdue. Just like Steve, I've been around a long time too. I started off as an area planner over here, a little site office at Young and Key Watton 40 years ago. Uh, and uh, at the time, you know, Eglinton, I think, was first proposed in 1980, early 80s, as, a, as, as an east-west line. We all know it was started, Harris filled in the hole, 
We're finally back to square one, so time to move forward. Next. Here's the map that you, uh, uh, various people have referred to called the Big Move. This is the plan that Metro Lakes put together, and I was on the board for two terms when we did that, that tries to capture, obviously schematically, the kind of transportation network that we would love to see in this region by 2031. And this includes, as I said, more subways, more LRT, more streetcar service, more bus service, bus rapid transit, all day go service. You know, just think of the go train. You wouldn't need a schedule anymore. You throw it away because every 15 minutes or every half an hour there's an electrified go train. You know, that's the kind of European system many of you are familiar with. We need, if we're serious, to achieve all that, a ton of dough. Next. <laughs> so here are some ideas. This is a short list. There's 25 of these tools that have been talked about, tried, adopted, implemented, all over the goddamn world, except here. <laughs> so here they are. And every single one of them is controversial as hell. I'm going to tell you that. Nothing is easy here. Because, why? Because we've been screwing around for the last 25 years not doing next to anything. And, yeah, 40. But 25 for sure. And, and, the place keeps growing, right? And so we need more and more service, and we just keep talking. So here, let me go through this real quick. This is on a regional basis of the greater Toronto Hamilton area, because we're all in this together, as I said. Okay, so if 10 cents a kilometer road toll was adopted throughout the entire 400 series highway network, including the Gardner and the Don Valley Parkway, generates a billion dollars a year forever. If you asked people to pay one loony a day, not an hour, a day, on all non-residential parking spaces throughout this region, so that all the Yorkdale malls, the Fairview malls, everywhere except residential, generates a billion dollars a year forever. You could obviously, I didn't put a number in here, but you could do a gas tax surcharge. <coughs> Controversial, but you guys all know who, who put gas in your car, that price is elastic. One day it's here, the next day it's there, six months later it's over here, etc. The fact of the matter is the greater Vancouver region, the lower mainland, has done that. And it's in place and all the money from that gas tax levy and all these other tools would be totally, 100% dedicated to transit. Another idea, of course, is you could get a better deal from the provincial government. As you've heard already, you know, we used to get uh, uh, capital and, a, and a, a large percentage of the operating funds paid for by the province. That, of course, was eliminated. Now it's zero. So all the money comes out of the city taxpayers. So that's another agenda. Here's another one that's already been mentioned by Richard. Sales tax. If you adopted a 1% or 1 cent on a dollar regional sales tax for the greater Toronto Hamilton area, only the region, not the province, and that money was totally dead fund transit in Los Angeles County. And many of you, I'm sure, have been there. You know it's the freeway capital of the world. But the reality is, with that guaranteed revenue stream, they are going to borrow that money in advance and expedite the construction of all that transit. So instead of taking 30 years to build those new transit lines in LA County, we're going to do it in 10. And that's leadership. Next. OK, now I'm going to get personal because, you know, these things are just illustrative, but these are things that all of us do every single day, right? So I say, okay, let's have some fun here. If you apply a 10 cents a kilometer road toll, road pricing charge, from Oakville to Toronto, 120 bucks a month. But people already pay 121, and obviously rising, for a TPC monthly metro pass. If you're the same person in Oakville taking the go train, you're already paying 215 a month, right? But here are some of the things that we all probably have. You know, cable TV, it varies, of course, according to the plan you have. Cell phone, same issue. Could be this cheap, or could be a lot more expensive, or whatever. But we don't think about it. And a lot of us, you know, go and buy a, a second cup latte or a Starbucks every day for $4 or whatever, right? And I think it's important to put all this in context. What is your extra time worth? 
It's been referred to the civic action, which I am associated with, which John Tory has launched this campaign called What Would You Do With 32? And the idea is that right now, the average commute time, daily commute in the greater Toronto area is 80 minutes a day. It's the worst in North America, worse than LA. And if we do nothing, it'll go to 109 minutes a day in the next 20 years. So roughly an extra half hour. Next. Here's a great quote. Basically, nothing's free, you know, but people tell you.